Moses' turn in chapter 8. I may have not had the sound on for chapter 7, so <laughs> sometimes that happens. <laughs> but anyway, <coughs> we continue. Um, chapter 8 is about search systems. And one of the first things they <coughs> say in the chapter is that you really should question uh, whether or not you need a search or not. You think about the search box that's up in the top of the, um, usually at the top of the site page, the main site page. And the thing is that <coughs> um, when, do you, when do you usually use the search anyway? It's like when you can't find what you're looking for. So that means somehow the navigation system is failing and um, you're looking for something on a particular site and you can't find it. And I know through personal experience that usually these search tools don't work very well on the sites themselves. And that um, what I usually do is that I uh, <coughs> go back out to Google and I search on Google and then I find <laughs> what I'm looking for. Uh, because like, I could also use an example. Um, if I go to um, the college page again. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there's a search. So there's a search box up here. And if I want to find something like um, it's the code of our class, I get the theme overview. OK, so. So I can actually find it here. I want to find something like um, <coughs> I get the, the main page for the research groups in, in um, the logistics department. But I don't get the health department, for example. And then I also I get my own page because I happen to have it in English, and then it shows up. Uh, but I don't get the <coughs> research groups in the health department. Do I get both health and and. Um, Logistics, which is still under the old name of OES, if I do Forschungsgruppe. But I also <coughs> typed it in as uh, two separate words, and it still found it. So that's one thing that the search engine works um, uh, to take uh, words that are similar. Um, Uh, let me see if I want to find working dates. I get some. I get this here. So the, the search tool is working pretty well for for this site, but it may not always uh, be the case. I think I need some. some point, I don't know if it's still here. Mm. I haven't changed this page in many years. <laughs> uh, I used to have a search box on the page. Yeah, search this site. <coughs> I don't know if it still works. So let me see.
so <coughs> because <coughs> I have a tool on my site it includes a search box so I can actually um, uh, crawl the site for the content and then it puts up some keywords in the search box for the site and then there's other kinds of tools like you can use uh, like a Google search tool if you want um, to put up a search box on your site but one of the first things you should decide is like do I need a search box or not and uh, how do I want to group the information on the search box let me go back up to here <coughs> Does your site have enough content? Uh, will it steal resources from navigation? Is there enough time? Are there better alternatives? And one of the things that you can use an, as an alternative is a site map. Because sometimes a site map gives you the overview of the structure of the site. Or you might use an index. And these can be uh, more effective than a search engine. So when do you need a search engine? Maybe when you have too much context, uh, the site is fragmented, your users expect it, or your site's too dynamic. <coughs> the typical approach to search is that <coughs> you um, <coughs> identify <coughs> what you're looking for, you formulate a query, you do the search, you get some results, and these results, you might select some of the results and refine your search and examine them. So this is the typical step, this is steps for search engine. Uh, what the book especially talks about in this chapter is it talks about uh, determining search zones. And this is about how you're organizing your site. Like when we saw the site for the recreation equipment, uh, we saw that there was different categories for camping and for other um, recreational equipment. So you can, as you can break your content down into homogeneous content types, and you can do it by content type, audience, uh, subject, topic, geography, chronologically, uh, author. The New York Times website broke the. Um, site down into chunks of uh, international news and um, American US topic news entertainment and so forth so they broke it down by topic type um, and then if you have a search you might have a search that only is effective within that particular area and then you can use um, navigation versus uh, destination so there's different types of pages. Some pages have mostly navigation tools on them that help you to find things. And other things are the, the end of the search, the, the destination page that have the content that you're looking for. And you can um, sometimes have pages that are a combination of both, like we saw on the, on the recreational site. A lot of the um, e-business sites have both. Uh, I can also use an example of uh, Finn, for example. Mm. <coughs> so Finn, it, when you go to the top page, it's mostly a navigation page. And it's breaking things down into different types of zones. Um, <coughs> so these are search zones to help make your search a bit easier. So if I go into uh, the target then I can actually get a search bar here so then I can start searching from this search zone so if I was searching in this area for um, Shih Tzu which is a kind of a dog then I get there I get like uh, 30 hits on this so it's not that many but it's easier to look uh, within a zone, than to look, um, than to look within the whole site to break it down. The search tool to work within the zone, and then within this zone, this is also breaking it down into further categories like geographic areas, um, and then when you get the results, you can have the results sorted by the date or the price or the most relevant. So, 
one thing is to be able to break down the content into different zones where you can search in different zones. And then when you get the results back, how you present the results, that's, that's later on in the chapter that they talk about that. Um, the other thing is if I go back and I want to look, if I go um, for um, something else like car, okay, I'm not getting a search tool here, let me look, property, okay. So here I get a search tool. If I put in the same thing here, I don't expect to get anything because it's in the wrong search zone. So I get zero, zero things. But if I put in something else like Molda, then I get a lot of hits. So you can see that the search engine is not re relevant for the entire site. It's only relevant for a particular zone. Okay. Um, <coughs> this chapter also talks a lot about um, how uh, search engines work. In p and um, <coughs> so they talk about uh, what is the difference between uh, recall and precision. Um, so recall and, let me see, recall and precision is discussed on page 159. And in the book, they give a slight, uh, there's a slight mistake to the definition. So the definition of, uh, first of all, rec recall is OK. It says the number of relevant documents retrieved divided by the number of relevant documents in the collection. And that's OK. That means if you have, um, <coughs> uh, you have like, 10 relevant documents in there. And when I searched for Shih Tzu, there was 30 relevant documents uh, in the collection. And the amount of relevant documents uh, ret retrieved, well, I don't actually know if there was more, but I'm assuming that it, it, it had a 100% recall rate because it found anything with the word. But um, maybe I, I don't consider all the things that it got back as being relevant because like it also included uh, like a sleeping uh, equipment or something like that. It didn't just it didn't just include the dogs, but included some equipment that goes with the dogs. So in that case, um, it, the maybe the number of relevant documents uh, was um, uh, much smaller than the ones, uh, and they, then the recall should have been that they defined all of the things that were relevant. Like, were there any more dogs out there that it could have returned and it didn't return? And I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is. And then precision is the number of relevant documents retrieved divided by the total documents in the, the, the total number of documents that are retrieved. OK. So then the precision is that um, <coughs> if I retrieved total number of documents retrieved were 30 documents. And then the number of relevant documents from that group were five. Then the precision would be five divided by 30. So, uh, so the definition in the notes is the correct definition. And the definition in the book is needs to be corrected to this. So the one on page 159, it should be total number of documents retrieved. Okay. And usually, people want to make sure they get everything that's relevant for them. So they want to get the good recall ratio, but they want to also have precision. So they want to get things that are relevant to them. OK, uh, stemming is uh, when you use part of the word. And I already see here that this, I'm not going to be able to change this, but it should be uh, the computer has a common root. And um, it could be compute. So this is also. So computer has a common root of compute. 
with computation, computing, uh, computers. So there was already two typing mistakes here. So that should be root and compute. Um, <coughs> and then weak uh, stemming is only to include uh, the plurals of the word. So I said before we had um, <coughs> bicycle and bicycles. And if you searched on bicycle, you should get bicycles. And if you search on bicycles, you should get bicycle. Uh, OK. And then the presenting the search is uh, how much do you want to present and how much is too much information. Um, and the rule of thumb that they say in the book uh, is that you, they have been presenting like 10 results on a page. And uh, like if you look at, if you do a Google search, <coughs> usually you come up with 10 results on the page. And then you get 15,000 or 15 million pages. <coughs> That's OK. But they usually only put 10 results on the page. And usually you don't go through more than a couple of pages because you don't have the patience for that. So there must be a good type of uh, ranking algorithm in order to get what you think is most relevant at the top. Uh, so ways of listing results. Uh, and results can be listed either by sorting, alphabetical or chronologically, and also by ranking. And <coughs> the way things are ranked, <coughs> like on a local site like uh, Molda, you might have it as in terms of how often does the word occur on the document, or how many times does the, the word occur within the collection. So if you are looking for a word like um, like, um, let me see, uh, research. Then research, if it appears um, like um, five times in the documents, it would show up before, if it, the, the, it would be ranked higher than if it showed up once in the document. But if a word occurs quite frequently in all documents, uh, then you wouldn't want to have that as a high ranking. So something like um, uh, a preposition, like uh, in the English language, for, uh, at, of, these words are prepositions. They're called stop words. And these words are usually excluded <coughs> from ranking, from, uh, ranking in, in, in indexing, because you don't want to include uh, every time a document has uh, 16 uh, um, items or 16 accounts of the word from in the document. You don't want to include that because it's, it's not meaningful for your search. So you want to include uh, only the relevant terms. And usually, the relevancy of the term goes um, <coughs> up inversely with the number of times it, it appears in the document set. So if you have a word like research, uh, it, should, it should still fit within this relevancy uh, grouping because research occurs, I mean, in the in the college website, research might occur in a lot of documents, but it doesn't occur in all documents. And then uh, it should also be, if it occurs a lot within the document, then it gets a higher ranking. But if it's like the word uh, the, then the word the appears in all documents. And it may appear a lot of times in a particular document, but that doesn't matter because it's in all the documents, so we don't want to include it. So it has to do with um, both the appearance of the word within the document set and the appearance of the word within the document itself. And then there's other ways to do ranking as well. Um, Google <coughs> uses a page rank algorithm. And Google is like a, is like a global search engine. And uh, so they use an algorithm that has to do with your the page rank of your website is related to how many other websites point to you and how many websites do you also point to. But more importantly, how many others point to you. And if you are um, a site like Hukskuni Mola, I can look up the page rank and it was something like six, which was, which was pretty high. But if I look up the page rank for my own web page, it's like a two. 
because it's very insignificant. So not many pages point to my web page, but many more pages point to the college's web page. And because it gets a higher page ranking in Google, then if I search for um, uh, Molda, I will get uh, the college's web page will come up higher on the web uh, ranking scheme than my own web page because um, this is more significant. It has a higher relevancy than my w personal web page. So you can do that on a global basis, like with a global search engine, but you can also have some kind of a page ranking or relevancy system within a site as well. And within, the, within a, like a customer site, they might have, um, uh, because they have search zones, so if you're looking for fishing equipment, then you have uh, within that area how many documents mention fishing and how many, um, like if I have the boots, the boots came up, right? Uh, maybe uh, that one was ranked higher because fishing was mentioned five times in the document as opposed to the t-shirt where fishing was only mentioned once in the document because you could wear the t-shirt and then while you're doing camping as well. So it's not just related to fishing, whereas the boots were more important to fishing. So the ranking, and they, this was visual, so it just showed everything in a row. But if there had been 11 pages of this stuff, then I would hope that the boots came up on the first page and that the t-shirt came up on the one of the other lower pages. So you want the most relevant things to come up first. So another thing is how do you group results? Um, you can group them by uh, relevancy also or chronologically, like what was the most um, recent. Like if you're on a website that, that you're um, searching for um, like a flight information and you get this number of flights that come up as a result, you can, you can s group them or sort them according to uh, what is the best price, what is the least amount of time. So you have different ways of grouping the results. Uh, who are, what are all the flights by a particular airline? So you can, you can choose that. And then exporting results, um, this is not so important. I think you can, you can make copies of it, you can share it, you can print it, you can email it. And then designing the search interface, this is um, discussed on pages 178 to 192. And basically it's, um, uh, it's telling you that you should make your search engine simple. You should not really use advanced searches because advanced searches, people don't make use of them. Like when you go into to Google or when you go into Finn or whatever, you, you type in the words, that the keywords that you're looking for. You don't use the um, Boolean operators like and and or, for example. I think that's very rare that people use that. So they say you should make it as simple as possible. And uh, you should, uh, they suggest like some sites have options for making the search narrower or making the search more uh, global. So you can do that as well, or broader. And then um, sometimes when the results are presented, it also shows you where you have been searching. So there's an example on page 187, which is the Dell example. And it sh shows that the Dell search system shows where you have searched. So if you get a search result, it says technical support, meaning that you had searched in the zone that is technical support. So a search engine should tell you, you should kind of know if you're searching the whole site or if you're searching a, a zone within the site. And um, by like the Finn way of doing it, you know you're within a certain area, you know you're within a zone. So you know you're not searching the entire site. But sometimes, like with Dell, they need to tell you which area you're searching under. So they say you're searching under technical support. So if you want to search somewhere else, you need to be in a different area on the site. 
uh, if you don't get what you expected, uh, then you should get some kind of support back. So if you get too many results, you might get tips for how you can improve the search. Uh, tips for how you can uh, search in a different, different zone or narrow the search. And if you don't get any hits, then, then you should also get help as to what you could search for. Maybe some other suggestion. Um, but because if people don't find what they're looking for with the search, like I do, I go outside the site and search on Google, and then I can maybe come back to the site, or maybe I go someplace else. Uh, they also mentioned that the search engine should allow integration of searching and browsing. So you can uh, use the search like uh, we had in the Amazon site. Uh, you can search for a word or a topic, and then you can browse the results of the search, and then that might lead you to do another search, and vice versa. Um, so we talked about if you get stuck. And then there should be, uh, again, if you get stuck, there should be no dead ends. So it just means that you should give uh, tips for what to do next. Um, a means of revising the search, search tips, a uh, means of browsing, uh, or uh, human contact information. So if you don't get any uh, help from the website, you should give people a way to contact the site administrator, or contact us if you don't find what you're looking for. Because when you people get don't find what they're looking for, it can be very frustrating and can lead to losing customers. Okay, so these again, as I said, the, the notes for the chapter are very short and they're kind of all summarized in these first few, um, in this page, this I added in, um, in this page, this page, and this page. That was all of the notes basically uh, for, this, for the chapter. Um, also mentioned that uh, Google has a custom search engine that you can incorporate into your website if you want to. And as I said, that uh, there's one version of it that you can get for free, but then you have to have ads. And there's another version that you can pay for if you want to, and then you don't need to have ads. Um, I think I have a different system on my web page. Now I can't remember where it was. Uh, but. Um, uh, sometimes the tools that you get for like uh, network statistics also include search engine, and that was the case for my page. Um, let's see. Okay. So, uh, what are some of the issues with search engines? Uh, computers don't understand documents or queries. Uh, they just um, a bag of words. And so you have to make sure that you pick the right words, the ones that are meaningful for the search. And this is an example of what is a word, um, that there's lots of different languages. And in some search engines, they're looking for maybe spaces between the words. But in other languages, there are no spaces between the words. So you would have to use a different technique for indexing uh, the words within a document. And that's why usually within sites like um, with Chinese, uh, there's different search engines that were developed in those countries because they work better with that language than trying to force like an English uh, search based or a Western society's uh, languages, uh, that, you know, type of search engine on, on that type of, on a different type of language. Uh, this is an example of uh, words, and we have, I don't think the whole article is here, it's just part of the article, but you might have McDonald's, which is mentioned uh, 14 times, and fat and fries, and this uh, article is about how they're making the fries more healthy and uh, about how they're using a different kind of oil. So you might pick out some of these terms as search terms that would be indexed. Uh, however, uh, the words like uh, 
uh, the and from and so forth would not be included, but some of these would be included. So the, I'm not going to go through everything here because this was other people's notes, but um, the words don't tell us everything about what the content is, but it does tell us a lot about what the content is. And sometimes it doesn't matter how you uh, order the words, uh, it still tells us something about what the content of the article or the, con or the site might be about. So it's easy to just come up with the words that occur most frequently, for example. And then um, talking about Boolean retrieval, people maybe don't always think about uh, searches in terms of Boolean expressions. So this is something that's sometimes used in advanced searches, but uh, it's something that the, the end user should not normally have to be exposed to. Uh, if uh, Google uses <coughs> an and uh, to get a more inclusive result, uh, the people don't need to know that they use the AND or, or in OR rather. <coughs> so, um, so if it's this and that, you usually have to overlap and you get the, the stuff that overlaps. But if it's this or that, then you get everything. And if it's this and not this, then you don't get this part. So, um, so you have <coughs> A and B is uh, the overlapping area. A or B is everything A with A or B. And then A or C, not A, would be C. Or A, not B is just is this part of A, but not, not this part. And then there's the logic tables, which is the same. Um, a or B. So if you have A and you don't have B, then it's true. And if you have A and you, and you have B, then it's also true. So, and this can be used to put uh, to find out how you, the relationship between words. So you have the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog's back. And you have another document with different words in it. And you list the terms in the documents. And then you see all the words in, that appear in document one and all the words that appear in document two. And then the ones that you take out are the stop words or the common words like the prepositions and the common verbs. And then you get a list of possible terms to index. And when you do this across a lot of documents, uh, then you can uh, search on something like uh, back or two words together. So if I t search on dog and fox, I get that dog and fox appears in document three and five. If I pr search for dog or fox, it appears in documents three, five, and seven. If I search for dog, not fox, it's, uh, I get no results. And if I search for fox and not dog, I get one uh, document. So you can do this um, with any set of documents and terms. An inverted index is when you search on a term, and then you get to point to the documents where those terms appear. And then, um, so the Boolean queries allow you to search on the terms, and then it allows you to point to the documents where those terms appear. OK, so we can go through this a bit.
So if we're going to use Boolean operators, uh, the strengths are that it's precise. Uh, if you know what you're the right strategy and you know what you're looking for and it's fast. The weakness is that the users don't usually know Boolean logic and you get you don't know what type of size of the results that you're gonna get. And um, you don't know like which of the documents are good and which ones are not good. You don't know how um, um, when to s when to s say it's uh, not relevant enough to continue reading. So rank retrieval is uh, you don't need to know all of these details, but this is just basically um, how you would estimate when uh, how you rank something as important or not important. So you can skip over these uh, different types of <coughs> formulas and just look at uh, term weights consist of two components, local, how important is the term in this document, and global, how important is the term within the collection. So you have uh, terms that appear often in the document should get high weights. So if I get um, fries five times in the document, I get a higher weight than if I get it one time and terms that may appear in many documents should get low weights. So the words like from and the would get low weights. And then how do you capture this mathematically? You have a term frequency that's local and an inverse document frequency that's global. And then <coughs> you can do this, you can include this in a ranking algorithm which allows you to rank the results of your uh, search. But normally this is done, you know, by a search tool if you incorporate a search tool in your site. What you mostly need to do is be able to section off which types of content you go into into different index and search domains. So the zoning part is really the design issue, and then you just adopt a search tool that does this. Okay. And this is about Heap's Law. It's one point about Heap's Law is that when you add new documents to the system, you're usually adding uh, the same words over again. So if I add uh, all the words in Chapter 7 to my index, and then I add all the words in Chapter 8 to my index, the number of words are not going to increase that much, but the number of occurrences of words uh, will increase, of course. But they're not going to have more unique words because they use practically the same word set that they use in both documents. So, <coughs> so the postings keep growing, but the n number of uh, unique words don't grow. And most uh, systems uh, work this way. They have a, a Ziff's law. It's a, it goes like like this. So you have um, uh, some words that occur a lot, um, and then some words that occur very infrequently within a distribution. I have also another document set on this. So you see that the word frequency are the 50 most common words in the English language, and these uh, become the stop words in the document. And this would be the same set of words in the English uh, language in a, in a library book or in a most popular website. It would, for if it was in English, it would be the same set of words. Should be critics. Um, this is about how you break up uh, the words, and this becomes an issue when you have different languages. 
so like if you have Chinese then the words usually occur in groups of two uh, character set two characters together so then there's different types of uh, grams or s separation seg segmentation groupings that are used And then this talks about how you make use of uh, stemming, which is also mentioned in the chapter. Um, how much stemming do you want to use? It adds to the size of your, of your index. Kay. And then stemming may not work across languages. So usually you would probably have a different index uh, depending on the language that you're using. Okay. So all of this stuff at the end is like kind of just supplemental to the concepts. Oh, sorry. Just kind of. But in in chapter eight, in terms of chapter eight, it's like uh, what is in the chapter itself you should look at, and then most of the content up to like this set of notes well this one also I guess and then once we get up to here it's sort of uh, the other set of notes and it's just to further explain some of the concepts that are in the chapter itself but you don't have to know this in any great detail so I would just focus on everything up to this is like slide 30 in the, in the book and it relates to the it relates to the chapter. Okay, so that's it for today. I'm sorry, chapter 7 probably didn't get recorded, but I would recommend everyone to read chapter 7 and chapter 8, read the chapters in the book, and then take from the notes what relates to the chapters. So use the chapters as the first uh, guideline to what's important. Okay.